You are now listening to The Big Trade with Peter Pham, enlightening conversations for maximum market returns. My name is Patrick O'Shaughnessy. I've, I'm a portfolio manager at a company called O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. I'm also a writer. I've written a book called Millennial Money, How Young Investors Can Build a Fortune. Uh, and my area of interest and passion is investing in the global stock market, trying to understand what makes markets move the way they do, to understand common attributes that the most successful stocks have had across long periods of market history, and try to build strategies around those common characteristics. Um, so that is my, my primary area of interest. In terms of your observation, what is it that you think um, allows stocks to gain momentum, for example? Um, so momentum, I, I'm not sure. I think it would be very difficult to pin down. You know, I think that there, there's definitely some herd behavior in the stock market. And when we study market history to see, again, what those common attributes are of the best performers, momentum is one of those factors that the top. So stocks that have done very well relative to the market over the last, say, six to nine months tend to continue to do well the next six to 12 months. So that kind of flies right in the face of, of this idea of efficient markets. Uh, but it's been a very persistent trend that momentum persists in the overall market. And, and um, what so are the statistics exactly behind that, by the way? About So the, stati- the statistics are, roughly speaking, you can go back about eight decades worth of market data in the U.S. back to the 1920s. So you can more or less include every kind of market, including the Great Depression. And across that 80-plus year period, the stocks, the top 10% of the universe of stocks, if you kind of did an annual rebalance strategy based only on momentum, would have outperformed the market, the broader market, by about 5% per year over that long sample size. So a significant degree of outperformance. What's the frequency Um, of rebalancing? So you can do it a lot of different ways. Um, The simplest way to do it to to run these tests is a very naive annual rebalance, sort of like you would rebalance a normal index. Mm -hmm. Uh, But instead of buying on you know market cap, which is what indexes are looking at, you buy on some other factor. That's probably the simplest way to evaluate these these ideas. Hmm. Interesting. Any, any other aspects towards what you think um, helps uh, stocks appreciate or generate capital gains for investors? We, I know we offline we talked a little bit about William Thorndike and his terrific book, The Outsiders, as well. And I know you cover that in in your book as well, uh, in terms of companies that are, you know, uh, capital efficient to some extent. Yeah, so in addition to this momentum factor we already talked about, the two other most dominant uh, things that we've seen in our research have been valuations. So you want to buy companies, broadly speaking, that are cheap. Everyone says that, of course, and everyone says Ben Graham is their, is their biggest influence and they want to buy margins of safety, et cetera. Uh, the data bears that out, that if you buy low PE stocks, low price to sales stocks, low price to cash flow stocks, and you do that very in a very disciplined fashion, over time, you'll do very well. Uh, the difficulty is in actually executing that strategy. Um, you know, for, there, there's a very recent example of how tough it can be with the crash of all these global energy stocks. Mm-hmm. Those stocks look very cheap prior to that crash. So there, it is, it is very difficult to actually implement a value strategy, but it works. And then the final and a key finding is this idea of capital allocation that, that Thorndike discusses in his awesome book, uh, which is more or less you want to buy companies who are efficient and smart asset allocators. What that means for us, if you could boil it down, is you want to avoid companies really reliant on outside capital and financing. Mm -hmm. So if companies are issuing new equity, it could be an IPO, secondary offering, a lot of new debt versus the kind of scaled by the size of the company, that's a bad thing. Whereas if companies are paying down debt, paying a lot of dividends, and repurchasing a significant quantity of shares while not issuing a lot at the same time, that combination has led to really strong and successful and consistent market outperformance over time. So the three kind of key pillars we find are value, momentum, and this idea of, of what you call it shareholder yield or capital allocation. In, in terms of shareholder yield, you know, in this current environment, Patrick, we, we have relatively low interest rates that have yet to quote unquote normalize. So what do you think about companies that are able to borrow at, you know, zero and able to generate significant gains off of that. I, I understand from a capital structure perspective might not look as attractive, but 
clearly from, you know, uh, a cost of capital, it, it seems like it could relatively work to some extent. Yeah, it's a question we get all the time. You companies that sure are buying back a lot of shares, but they're just doing it with, um, and, and sort of doing a swap given how low interest rates are. A couple things. One, we would, we would prefer and the data would suggest you should prefer companies that are, are net paying back stakeholders. That would include debt. So it's superior to look at the entire kind of the easiest way to do it is on the statement of cash flows on financing cash flows, the entire picture that includes and favors companies paying down debt, buying back shares, um, not it just issuing debt to buy back shares. You can test this in, in periods like the 1970s of, you know, big, steady, rising interest rates to see how this idea of shareholder yield works. And it works quite well. And it's, um, there's still pretty robust excess return for high shareholder yielding stocks in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it stands up to a lot of scrutiny. Uh, we would prefer to just issuing debt to, to buy back shares just in the pure swap. Uh, mm. but, but even, even those companies historically have outperformed. So, uh, there's a little nuance here, but the general idea is you do like companies buying back shares and paying strong dividends. Are you willing to be a little bit more lax based on where we're at at the current business cycle? Say, for example, if we were in a situation where rates were going to get cut and, um, there was going to be, you know, more liquidity within the markets, then perhaps if a company is borrowing a little bit, you're willing to make a, a few exceptions in that case, especially, say, for the case of R&D, like a company like Apple, for example. Yeah. It's very difficult to forecast, maybe impossible, to yeah. forecast <laughs> the, the direction of rates as we've seen all too clearly. I think everyone, everyone probably on your show ever has gotten it wrong, maybe with one or two exceptions. We certainly have in our just casual observations. It's not a part of our process at all. Really, no forecasting is. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just we just think it's 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 inconsistent and, and unreliable. So maybe if we could somehow forecast those variables, we could adjust uh, or give more leeway, as you describe it. But but we don't. We just we operate in a pretty uh, parsimonious, flat way. Always preferring stocks of similar character. Uh, you know, we look at other things too. So earnings quality. We look at companies' balance sheets and their overall leverage. We look at trends in their earnings. Um, uh, obviously, their valuations, that's really key, as I mentioned, uh, in addition to just their shareholder yield. So there's a number of things to look for, yeah. uh, but we, impl- we employ a pretty static approach. It's not, it's not dynamic trying to guess changes in the macro environment and adjust accordingly because that would just be too hard to do. You, you mentioned earlier oil stocks, and I, I researched earlier that you have quite a lineage going all the way back to a hundred years where, you know, people within your family were actually involved in the oil and gas space. I I also see that you've highlighted some interest in that sector as well. Are there any particular companies that you think would um, benefit from a potential recovery in crude oil prices? Yeah. I mean, if you look purely as a value investor across the board, there's a lot of things that pop up. I mean, the the obvious ones are kind of the global integrated companies. So Mm -hmm. names like BP, a lot in Europe. So names like BP, Total, ENI, Royal Dutch Shell, um, are definitely names that, that, that have looked attractive over the, over the last six months or so. Now some start to get more expensive with new earnings reports. So that's an interesting dynamic to watch. Uh, but it's really been kind of the, the big names that have, have popped out most prominently. Yeah. Um, but, but the important thing is, you know, with the, like with any portfolio, with a value portfolio, you want to be spread out. You don't want to just buy energy stocks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but definitely some interesting names in Europe. We've been very fortunate actually in my fund, Patrick. We've actually, um, prior to even the decline in the oil price, we started building a position in Kinder Morgan. And despite whatever pullbacks have happened, just based on how it's going to act like a toll road for, you know, the oil and gas space overall throughout, um, the continent, it's, it's actually worked out and we've been quite fortunate from that respect. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, there's such interesting, it's such an interesting sector. And I, I think the history of it is awesome. As you mentioned, I've got, um, some family lineage. My great grandfather was, was a wildcatter yeah. and built, built a very successful company called Globe Oil. Um, a lot of which originally was refining operations. So, you know, that's been great lately that, that refiners have, have done really well, uh, because their, their input cost has been cut so much. But, you know, really fascinating history in the overall sector. And I, I'm fascinated to watch what goes on now. It's, it's very hard to, to predict again or forecast what's going to happen. But, I think that the key, one key point is that 
if you read like Daniel Jurgen's books, uh, The Prize and the Quest on the History of Oil, which are awesome, awesome histories that I highly recommend to anyone listening, mm -hmm. uh, what you see is that all these big integrated companies have been around forever and they have weathered a lot of storms. Uh, I'm sure I think their earnings will drop, their cash flows will drop. Typically, they've protected dividends um, and paid really steady dividends. Who, who knows? Anything could happen. But even in 2008, with a crazy drop in the price of oil, most of those stocks maintain their dividends. Um, so a fascinating sector and, and one that's definitely on the radar for value investors. You mentioned Jurgen. I've I have not had a chance. To, I've checked out the Quest briefly, uh, the Prize a little bit as well. But my actual personal favorite one is actually the Commanding Heights. I remember watching that when I was way back in high school, uh, starting to almost build a whole economic paradigm. And just to see, um, I'm not sure if you saw that one, but that's a very good series as well. I know PBS did a fascinating documentary of the books as well. Yeah, you know, I haven't seen it. I'll definitely check it out. But I would, I would say that Jurgen's the prize and then the first third or so of the quest, which is kind of the completion of his history before looking to the future. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that com, that combined history is maybe the most fascinating history that I've ever read. And I read a lot of history. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it, it is amazing and nuanced stuff. And it's sort of the history of the modern world told through us through a lens of energy. Right. Um, right. Which is obviously a huge part of kind of the, the industrial, the industrial world. You um, recently published a book um, that I found very interesting, which actually is the reason why I reached out to you was um, Millennial Money. I, I guess the audience, the demographic is millennials. How would you define that demographic? Because sometimes I find it to be a little ambiguous, figuring out what, what classifies as a millennial or Generation Y, for example. And wh what do you think is the significance of, of the message that you're trying to commute uh, to um, millennials? So it's, as you point out, the definitions range widely. I, the easiest thing to, is to say pretty much anyone born between 1980 and 2000, roughly speaking, there's about 80 million people that fit that bill. So it's a massive, massive generation about the same size as the baby boom. Uh, one of the early names for it, it was actually the echo boom. So a lot of baby boomers kids. 80 uh, million in the U.S. Is that what you're saying? 80, 80 million. Yes. Wow. Yes. In the U.S. And it's equally as big as the baby boomer generation. Is that what you're yes, saying? Sli probably slightly bigger, maybe a million or two more um, millennials than baby boomers. So it is a it is a very big cohort. And so my my goal with writing the book was to address what I see as kind of a big issue with with millennials, which is that they are very very risk averse when it comes to money and investments. Yeah. <laughs> either they haven't either they haven't started investing, or if they do. They've, they've made very conservative choices in terms of asset allocation, things like that, uh, mainly because they've been stung twice or three times, arguably, in their youth and, and early adulthood. Crashes in the stock market, two of them, crash in the housing market, watching what those crashes did to their families, loved ones, etc., cetera, um, has built a very skeptical worldview of financial markets in general amongst millennials. And my hope with the book was first to reach them and say, hey, the best thing you can do is just get started really young. Forget what you think about markets. The best advantage you've got is youth. If you can start when you're 21 or even 18 years old, you've got, you've got a leg up um, that few people ever have who typically wait till they're 40 to get started. Um, so that's one key message. But the second is, you know, you should open yourself up to what you think of as riskier assets, uh, things like stocks that are in the long run typically more safe than on an inflation-adjusted basis uh, than cash, which is you know a, a popular way of holding money for millennials right now. And then the other thing, honestly, that, that it's kind of a funny question uh, about reaching the millennial audience is that coming on shows like this one, it's almost more to reach the parents of millennials because for the most part, the way that we learn about investing stinks. It's not taught enough uh, in high school, certainly in college even, we're just unaware and it's not at top of mind. The best way of reaching younger people, I think, is through their parents or, or older friends or relatives. Um, and that's really who I try to reach more than anything because they can help reach the younger, the younger set and give them a big advantage. Um, so you kind of have to go an indirect route to get to them. Uh, but what I found is that when you present them with just the basic facts, and I think, I think my book is very readable. It's not long. Um, there's not a lot of math in it. A lot of stories. I mean, it's meant to really be an introduction to investing that, that we can make a difference for a lot of young people. So I would certainly encourage anyone listening, uh, that knows an 18 year old or a 21 year old or something like that to, to hand them a copy of the book. 
So, so what do you think is, is different that millennials need to take into consideration if trying to dip their toes into, um, the stock market? Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting trends happening in the investing space right now. The biggest of which is this kind of rise of the robo advisors um, that I'm sure a lot of listeners are following automated solutions with I think are fantastic because I think, you know, we tend to get in our own way when we invest. Um, the vast majority of people do. And companies like Wealthfront, um, which I know pretty well, I, and I've talked to a lot of people there, are, I think, great, great companies that are providing an awesome service for young people that help them get started. And it's it really is a set and forget option where you don't have to do anything. I think that's the most interesting trend. It's all index funds, mm-hmm. um, which we can get into. I don't necessarily agree with that approach, but it's a great starting point. And you know, out of a, if a hundred people ask me on the street what they should do, ninety-five, I'll typically say just buy global index funds and, and don't touch it. Right. Uh, pay very little and just just grow with time. Um, so I think that these automated companies, these software-based companies uh, like Wealthfront, are a great development for young people. And you mentioned to me previously offline about human capital and how millennials are probably invested more in that space and doing probably arguably better than the previous generations in that space, what are they doing and why is it so effective? Is that going to change the workforce, for example? And in terms of the whole trends in employment, what do you think is happening? So I think that there's so much interesting stuff happening here. And there's no doubt that our my generation's number one resource is this, this idea of human capital, very young, hopefully very bright futures ahead of us. The young generation has been, I think, very interested in entrepreneurship, in, in self-development, in small business, in, you know, one-person businesses, things like that. And I see that happening more and more. And I think the big reason for that is that the barriers to entry for starting a business have just fallen so significantly. No matter where you look, whether you're an author, or an artist, or a small business owner, uh, there's so many tools, a lot of them software-based or technology-based, that remove those barriers to entry and make it just much easier to be um, a small entrepreneur. And I think that's that's great. And young people are very interested in that trend. If you follow kind of what's popular, who the big journalists are, all those sorts of things, you see that over and over again, that sort of self-reliance, emphasis on self-improvement, small-scale entrepreneurship, things like that, uh, which I think are very healthy and, and very good and are very efficient ways of using skills. Is this part of that message about your concern about where the economy is going, where government fiscal policies are? I know you talk about your concern about uh, the United States' twin deficits. How is this all connected? And, and do you think there's some kind of correlation between human capital and where the economy is going? Very difficult to say where the economy is going I think the most interesting trend is the demographic trend that we've got a unique situation and, and we're bad, but we're not nearly as bad as most of the developed world <laughs> where we are getting, we are getting much, much older. I mean, if you go to Japan or it or a lot of the European countries, it's, it's disastrous. Uh, but in the U S we're, we're probably not even replacing our, our population. And the issue there is that the fastest growing age group is not young people, but people 65 and older. And if you could get even more specific, it's people 80 or 85 and older. Um, so that we, we're living longer and baby boomers are retiring in droves every day. What happens is we've got a much smaller support structure in terms of the number of people working, paying taxes, things like that compared to every retiree. You know, when we first started Medicare in, in the 1960s, there was about seven workers for every retiree. Today, there's four, four and a half. Uh, when millennials are in their prime earning years in a couple decades, uh, that number will be closer to two, just two people working for every retiree. So there's a, a smaller and smaller supporting workforce for every person that's retired. And I just think that that creates issues. I think that that creates a larger burden on governments through uh, through various programs. And I, I, I can't predict what will happen with those programs. After all, we, they started very quickly. They could end very quickly. But I can say with confidence that those are the demographics. That's just a reality. And it's that, I think, those facts should encourage young people to take more reliance on themselves, to not just count on third-party help later in life, 
but realize that we'll probably to a large degree be supporting ourselves. And that's why, you know, getting started and investing young is such a great, great opportunity. You, you discuss about something that sounds a little philosophical about karma and its relationship with um, money, capital. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that concept and how to sure, utilize that sure. to the best of your advantage? So my, my early lesson in karma was kind of a funny one. Um, I was a, I was a real slacker in high school, really went to a huge school, got very much lost in the crowd. Uh, there were something like 700 kids in my graduating class. Uh, and it was very easy to skate by, not really do any work, um, just be kind of a layabout. And that's unfortunately what I did. And I got a very, very, uh, memorable lesson one day, the spring of my senior year. I had applied to a bunch of schools. Um, you know, I had pretty good test scores and things like that. So I was overly ambitious with the schools I applied to. My grades were lackluster. And I got rejection letters from every single college that I had applied to <laughs> all on the same day. Um, so I came home to a, a mailbox full of, of rejections. And it made me realize very quickly that in life, you know, you're going to get out what you put in. And I had not put in much at all. Uh, and I got a very swift lesson in karma spring day. And from that point forward, what I've, what I've tried to emphasize personally and with any advice that I give or anything is, is that basic idea. People think of karma as kind of mystical mumbo jumbo. Uh, but karma, all it really means, the definition of the word is, is cause and effect. Uh, again, that you'll get out what you put in. And so my, my chapter on financial karma, as I call it, uh, is just that, that if you put in even very small amounts starting at a young age, do so consistently, don't pull it out, uh, just let it sit and grow. Um, but that is a form of very good financial karma and one that anyone can build um, and reap the benefits of. Um, so I think karma is a powerful concept in general, uh, but I think financially it's especially so because time uh, and the power of compounding are such powerful tools for investors. So after understanding a little bit about karma and finishing school, um, how did you get into the asset management business? So I had a, uh, admittedly a stroke of, of real luck. I was a philosophy major in school, kind of syncs with this whole idea of karma, I guess. Uh, but, but really didn't study business at all. Didn't take a single business class. Um, I don't know if I had ever even used Excel and, uh, didn't know anything about accounting, et cetera. My father is, has always been in the investing business and he was at the time, right as I graduated, leaving Bear Stearns asset management. Mm -hmm. And, and forming a company uh, where I now work, O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. And at the time, I, I didn't have any big interest in investing, but thought it would be pretty foolish to pass up the chance to be an intern, which is what I was, at you know the foundation of a new company. So I did that, and my my first real love was books. And so I started reading as much as I could on investing history, market history, research, etc., and then quickly fell in love with it, um, really because of the psychology aspect more than anything. Um, this idea that people are irrational agents, not these perfectly rational agents that a lot of theories would have them be. And so I, I fell in love with market research and kind of the rest has been history. So I got a very lucky start, um, obviously at a very rocky time in 2007, 2008. So it was a, a stroke of luck for sure, but I have, I have loved it ever since and uh, have been focused on market research for the last eight or nine years. Great. So Patrick, let's um, finish up this conversation with about uh, a talk about some of those books that you're really interested in. I think we covered already Outsiders. We discussed a little bit about some Warren Buffett books. Are there any other interesting books that are on your reading list right now? Doesn't necessarily have to be investment related. I'm actually just finished reading The Watchmen, which is that graphic oh, cool. novel, which is very yeah, interesting yeah. concepts, actually. Yeah. So, you know, I, I have, um, I would certainly encourage people to go to, I run a website. Um, the website is millennialinvest.com. And on that website is a, something called a book list. Right. And it's, it's something that every month I send out three to four books. I probably read yeah, at least a hundred books a year, um, sometimes 200. Hmm. And I send every month like three or four best that I've been reading. Um, so, so that's definitely one big source. I'll mention a couple here just because they were so influential on me. They are, they are investing books, but, but a lot of the books I recommend are not, which I think is really important. I think it's important to read very broadly. Uh, the two that really hit me in the face when I was younger, the first is a history book called Devil Take the Hindmost by a guy named Edward Chancellor. I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right. 
But Devil Take the Hindmost is a history of kind of history biggest manias, panics, crashes, fascinating stranger than fiction stories that give you a great window into market psychology. Wow. And the fact that circumstances change, uh, of course, you know, the world's very different than it was when the Dutch tulip mania happened or the South Sea trading company bubble happened. But the psychology of markets really hasn't changed at all. And one of my favorite charts that I've actually used in my writings is to overlay that South Sea bubble with the NASDAQ bubble and see an eerie similarity. <laughs> um, and, and even an, e an eerie similarity in, in things like, um, you know, people riding that bubble to issue just completely fraudulent stocks back in 1720 and then doing the exact same thing in 2000. Right. Um, so right. there's tremendous, there's so much value in learning history. And that's my favorite history book on markets. The second hmm. book is a book called Contrarian Investment Strategies by a guy named David Dreeman. Uh, okay. Dreeman's been around a long time. One of the first guys to look at systematically things like price to earnings ratios and, and buying stocks that are, that are out of favor, sort of a, an extension of the Ben Graham School of Value Investing. Mm -hmm. And his book has, has a great combination of market psych and with a lot of actual tangible strategies. Um, so it's a, it's a great book that struck me early on. Of course, I'd have to, I have to plug my father's book, What Works on Wall Street, which is a very extensive survey of stock selection strategies across history. Uh, obviously hugely influential for me. I was actually, uh, lucky enough to help write the fourth edition of that book as well. Um, so those three books are, are three that, that really affected me. They're mm -hmm. all investing books, uh, but, but great, great reads. When, when did, um, your father's book actually have any significance to you? Cause I'm sure when you were like very young, maybe, you're like, okay, I'm not really interested in this. Or was this always something that uh, resonated with you? So, of course, I read his books, but they didn't really click with me until I was probably 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly when, but I think when you start thinking about the real world and thinking about markets and things like that, that's when I got really interested. I had always read them, though, so I was you know, roughly familiar as a kid. Uh, I'm sure he'd give me hell if he, if he knew I was 20 before I really, <laughs> really appreciate it. <laughs> Let's let's make sure he doesn't listen to this episode. Then <laughs> I've also seen on your list you got uh, Josh Brown's uh, Backstage Wall Street, which is pretty interesting. It's a different perspective on brokerage and where that's going to evolve. You got a few of the market wizards. I just spoke to um, Jack Schwager himself. Very interesting insight. You should actually take a listen to that. That's the episode that was pre like I just released it last week. Actually, you might like that Great. one. Yeah. He's a fascinating guy and, and it's a, it's very fun to read interviews with, you know, legends of investing and you'll see a lot of common threads there. Again, a lot of value guys, a lot of, uh, you know, common, common ideas or strategies that make these successful investors tick. Um, so it's good reinforcement tied to great stories. So lo love Schwager stuff. Yeah. One of the benefits I get actually doing this podcast is it's almost a similar iteration of that where I'm hearing what you're saying. What we, I just went up and met with uh, Jim Rogers recently, got to hear what he said. Um, he's kind enough to invite us over hearing what Jack has to say. So yeah, it's, I think it's, um, very interesting to be able to, uh, hear collective, what I call them almost like mastermind sessions because you're, you're getting to hear all of these or read all of these conversations and try to take snippets of, of what you find insightful. Let's see what you, else you Let me give you one more book because yeah. I feel obligated to give a non-investing book. Sure. Um, but there, are, I, I always find in any good book threads that are applicable to investing. Yes, uh, me too. I think that, I think that lessons on temperament and kind of worldview and, uh, morality, all these things can be applied to investing. There's an unbelievable page turner of a book called Shadow Divers. Shadow Divers is about a small group of deep sea wreck divers who find an unidentified World War II ship off the U.S. coast. And the book is their search to try to rewrite history, basically, and figure out what this boat is, what it was doing there, uh, and piece together its whole lineage. It is an awesome, awesome kind of detective tale. Again, almost stranger than fiction, the stuff that these guys find. But it, it, the investing thread that I would point to is this, this two things, persistence, how powerful persistence is, just, mm -hmm. just sort of pig headed determination to figure something out. Uh, but also the willingness to do very detailed work. What we find over and over again is, 
is that we are fundamentally lazy and that there is an advantage still today, even with all the access to data and information that we have, there is an advantage to the person who is willing to do the deep, deep diligence on ideas, whether they be individual stocks, investing factors, things like that. Uh, and that book really shows those ideas of persistence and, and hard work and detailed work in spades. And it's one of the most entertaining books that I've read in a long time. So definitely check out Shadow Divers as well. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, point because I'm actually here in Asia and sometimes I actually spend time looking at investment opportun opportunities in emerging markets, frontier markets. And sometimes when I sit down and talk to investors, they tell me about their competitive advantage, about having information that the market currently doesn't have to some extent due to the inefficiencies in information release, whereas in developed markets, uh, at least objectively, information about companies should be released simultaneously. Everyone should have a clear understanding of, about the business. And I, me and Jack uh, Schweiger were talking about how it was more about the focus of what's important than just having that information and knowledge. And if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and, and focus on that information, you can develop your own competitive advantage. So I always felt as if, you know, if, if you're going to truly play in an even playing field and you're, if you're still able to identify or provide a new perspective that say the glass is rather half empty is actually half full, it can actually be a very interesting approach to, um, finding an edge. So yeah, in, well, I, I talk a lot about quantitative strategies, which I think is interesting because it's, it's an assessment of, of data analytics about price behavior and it's trying to find that edge. I know your dad does some of that as well in his, his book as well. So I, I think that it's um, always available. You just got to be willing to do the work and have an understanding about what information you're getting versus what information you're actually inputting. So it's either garbage in, garbage out, or if you're actually really putting in good information that has statistical significance, it, it can be a game changer. Yeah, no doubt. Well, thanks, Patrick. It was great having you on. Maybe we can catch up sometime soon to hear your latest perspective on markets and what millennials need to do. I, I think that, you know, it, people within this demographic, there, there's actually, like you said, there's some concern about um, entering in financial services and, and investing and investing in the stock markets. The unfortunate thing is that the rich are actually using this as their, their savings account. And that's why they're able to invest in these oligarchic companies, benefit from the capital gains as the market's making an all-time high. And it's unfortunate that if young people are not participating, they're just missing out on some of these opportunities. Yeah, and with the barriers to entry so, so low, and you know how simple it is to own global businesses, it's definitely a, a damn shame to, to pass up that opportunity. Yes. There's actually two perspectives on that, right? Domestically, maybe barriers of entry are low, especially on the secondary market, but maybe barriers of entry on a, a primary market or private equity perspective is going to become that much more difficult due to capital controls that have been implemented, implementation of things like Basel three that are yep. actually restricting smaller players to get in with limited uh, barrier of entry. So I'm kind of concerned about that dynamic, right? Uh, anyone can have a stock brokerage account, but they're concerned about the risk that's involved. And if they think that they can develop businesses or get into the spaces, I, I've talked to many people on the show about, you know, what if you were to try to replicate Warren Buffett's approach, his real approach, not his investing approach, but the, the mechanism that he developed to implement his investing strategy, it might be a little bit more difficult. And that's an unfortunate thing. And I believe that that window is closing. If you're looking at some of the news headlines, you're going to hear that, look, even if I wanted to create a multinational company this day and age, due to the whole repatriation component of keeping my capital offshore, uh, with that whole rhetoric about increasing on taxes for, for offshore profits, that can be a factor. Capital gains tax is a con potential concern. Um, you're doing all of this in an environment where there's so many entitlements and liabilities by the government and the state that who knows how much longer the window is open. So you have to be that much more astute and savvy in how you navigate this whole um, market and situation. 
I wonder how that will how that will kind of tie in all interesting points, how those those points will tie into this trend of more individual and small businesses where, where a lot of those issues don't exist. And, you know, maybe there will be more of that and less of less of what we've seen in the past. So it will definitely be fascinating to watch. Yes. Uh, watch what- I, I think I think from that comment or question is basically, yeah, small business, but you know, what are the key commanding, what are the key pillars of the economy and who owns that? Right. And, and yeah, fine. You can create the next Facebook, but you can take all the inherent risk involved in setting that up. And there might be some barriers of entry, potentially more so in the future if the internet becomes more regulated, but who owns financial services? Cause at the end of the day, um, financial services or, uh, oil and gas, like energy, these are some of the pillars of the economy, but it seems like all those industries are actually being rolled up and consolidated, right? And now if you want to enter that, you got to be a little bit more uh, creative in, in how you think. But the issue is that all the opportunities, the lower barriers of entry in financial services are global rather than domestic. But as an American, which I'm assuming you are, I'm not, I'm a Canadian, but still, is becoming difficult because how much can an American own offshore, right? Through FINRA and FACA, those are issues. I actually run an offshore hedge fund. So unfortunately, my largest demographic is in America and I'm not doing anything that's outside of the box. I just feel as if, you know, I, I work with an asset management company based out of London and we have a Cayman entity for a, a fund, for an open end fund, very liquid, very transparent. Uh, you know, Deloitte's our auditor, Mitsubishi's financials are custodian, nothing different from potentially what you guys are doing that are onshore and regulated, but it's tricky, I, I guess. And you have to be that much more, um, savvy and clever. The issue is that the, the level of technical intricacy of your understanding has to be that much greater. And how is a millennial going to make that leap? So sometimes when I talk to you, Patrick, you have the, advantage of having almost like generations of family, at least within the industry or, you know, auxiliary in- industries that are very similar to what you're doing. But we sometimes we got to think about that guy that's maybe in the ghetto that's thinking about what he's going to do and, and how he's going to make those, those jumps. So it, very interesting. And I'd love to um, catch up with you on that. We hope you enjoyed this mastermind session. If you'd like to contact Peter Pham or Phoenix Capital, please email info at phx-cap.com.